Gold Rush Girl. Okay, we're up to chapter 30. I slept poorly and rose into what was yet night. My muscles ached, my hands were stiff, my arms sore, my chest seemed heavy, and my hair felt like seaweed. Doubts tumbled in. I should never have come here. I should never have left Jacob alone. I'll never find him. I can't do this. I made things worse for Sam. I don't know what I'm doing. Sam, Thad, Senor Rosales, they're all doing things for me. What do I do for them? Make everything worse. And father will be here soon. Maybe mother. How will I be able to tell them that Jacob is gone? I hate myself. No, I fairly shouted at myself. You're just making excuses. I scrambled about our tent and found a cooked potato. Unsteady from tension, dissatisfied with myself, cold, wishing only to resume the search, I wrapped mother's shawl about my shoulders and went outside. I sat before the tent and ate the potato. I kept wishing Thad would hurry, but was not sure when he'd show up. I could see no stars or moon, the darkness made heavy by a mist that swirled around me like a wet black cloth. A briny sea smell was strong, the smell of the city equally strong. The only sound my, was my uneasy breathing. Now and again, I'd pass a hand over my cheek, wiping away driblets of water. I preferred to think it was mist, not tears. I suspect I was wrong. I shivered and drew my shawl tighter and wished I had hot coffee. But Senor Rosales' cafe was not open yet, and I had no energy to make a fire. Instead, I used my flint to light my lantern. It offered a pokey point of light and a hint of heat. I kept it close. As I continued to sit there in the middle of what seemed like a world of nothingness, my thoughts were mostly about Jacob. I tried to, tried to imagine where he was, but I was unable to summon a picture. I worried again about Sam, fearful that by my talking to the police chief, being at the Mercury and being seen, I had put him and his father at a greater risk than they even were. I remember someone I once read, oh sorry, I remembered something I once read, night is the devil's way of making you feel alone. I kept staring uphill looking for Thad. I was however from the direction it was, however, from the direction of Portsmouth Square that someone appeared out of the haze, as if materializing from a cloud. It took a moment for me to realize it wasn't Thad, but a man I didn't recognize. He seemed surprised to see me, too, because he halted, gawed at me for a moment, and then swerved in haste and hurried downhill, never looking back. I watched him go, thinking I knew him, but... He had shown up and disappeared so quickly, I could not recall exactly where or when I'd seen him. I looked across the way at the San Francisco Cafe restaurant and my thoughts went to Senor Rosales. Since we had said we must talk this morning, I felt obliged to tell him what I was doing, lest he worry. But there was no sign of wakefulness in his cafe. As I was thinking of him, I saw someone coming down the hill in what looked like a fuzzy star. It was Thad stepping out of the midst like a stick, scarecrow's ghost. I had told Jacob he wasn't my sweetheart. To be honest, I wasn't sure what having a sweetheart meant. All the same, I was surprised at how relieved and glad I was to see him. Morning, he called. Good morning, I said, standing up. Thank you for coming, he bobbed a nod. Waiting long? Didn't sleep well, I admitted. For a moment, he and I stood face to face awkward and unable to find the words. I was learning one must listen hard since what is truly said might well be mute. I had not listened well enough to Jacob. Now, as I stood there with Thad, what I felt beyond all else was gratitude. But all I said was, I have my flint case in my money belt in case our lanterns go out again. Knife, always. He wiped the wetness from his face guess we better get. I'm betting we'll find him. I tried to imitate by his yes by saying a yeah. He came out as uh. He returned and gave me a mocking snort. I grinned. I looked to the cafe, but there was no sign of Senor Rosales. So I said, let's go. Thad and I headed downhill, lanterns held before us, splashing through the muck and mud. The fog was so intense that we were unable to see more than 200 feet ahead. It was as if we were passing through a cloud. I'll lift it, I said. 
determine, oh, sorry, that echoing my thoughts said, fog will make it looking much harder. It'll lift, I said, determined to be optimistic. Moments later, I tripped over something. I had no idea what, and I went sprawling. Thad helped me get up, but I was damp and filthy and distraught, and my lantern had gone out. Are you all right? Fine, I said, although nothing seemed all right. He said, my light will work. While I worked to scrape off the mud, we kept on Thad's lamp as I told myself I mustn't let him see my tears. I don't know if he did see them, but he said nothing. We crossed over Montgomery Street and reached the Cove Beach, but knew it should only be knew it, it only because our feet crunched in sand and I could hear the gentle slip slap of water plucking against the shore. The swirling gloom made it very hard to see. Even though I knew that before us right offshore were hundreds of rotten row ships, I couldn't see one of them. How do you search for what is invisible? Thad said the obvious, hard to see. I said We'll just row out. Can't avoid the ships. Besides, I added, it's not as if we know where to look anyway. <clears throat> Thad grunted in agreement, then led the way to where we had left our rowboat. As we approached, I saw a blob of light. Thinking of that man who had gone past me as I waited for Thad, I halted. Someone's there, I said. Who to holler, said Sam. It's Sam, I mean, said Thad. It's Sam. He was right. Sam had remembered where our rowboat was from the day before and was sitting in it. I was so glad to see him. A small light was at his feet, giving a glow to his face. It occurred to me that I had never seen him smile. As we approached, he stood up. Morning. Good morning, I returned. Thanks for coming. The three of us stood staring out into the dark bay. None of us spoke. I, spent, I sensed something was wrong. Even as Sam continued to eye the bay, he said, Castle saw you at the Mercury last night and told my father and me to get out. Said we can't work there anymore. Oh, Sam, I cried. That's awful. Didn't even pay us what he owed us. Terribly upset, I said. We shouldn't have been there. Wasn't you. You were just bringing that lantern back. That god-awful man, said Thad. Sam finally turned around to face us and said, Not saying otherwise, I said, but... What will you and your father do now? Can you find another job? Probably at another saloon. The saloons like music. Don't know why. Nobody listens. He sounded so sad. I like your playing, I said. And as soon as I spoke, I felt embarrassed for offering up such an empty phrase. My father said he might try and find us a job on a ship going back. But as I told you, it's risky for colored folks. Hard to know who to trust. Thad said, how much will it take for you to get back home? Four, five hundred dollars, Thad said. If I get lucky at the gambling tables, you can have it. Sounds good, said Sam, but not as if he thought he would ever get the money. Sam, I said, what? I hated the way he was treated, but didn't want to say it so blandly. It seemed so empty and made me feel tongue-tied. What I finally said was, I'm sorry for what happened. He studied me for a moment. At length, he took a deep breath and added, just so you understand, when my brother vanished, we didn't know what to do. By the time we figured out what happened, he was gone. Nothing we could do to prove it either. Maybe he's on a ship. Maybe he's a slave somewhere. Maybe he got back to Sag Har Harbor. I hope so. We've never heard. So I'm willing to help find your brother, mostly my way of getting back at Castle. The three of us stood there awkwardly until Sam said, Okay, your brother, you have any idea how you go, how you going to look? I said, are you sure you want? There was anger in his voice when he said, I just said, finding your brother is hitting at Castle. Come on, I need to do something. Somewhat abashed, I said, I don't know a better way than just get on some boat and search. I looked at Thad, fine with me. To Sam, I said, do you have a better idea? Nope, he said, and stepped out of the rowboat. As I looked at the two boys, my emotions swelled, feeling as I did the strength of such friends. Impuls impulsively, I went up to Sam and hugged him, and then turned and did the same to Thad. Neither of them said or did anything. They were too surprised, or maybe they were just boys. I stood back, embarrassed at my own emotions, but glad that I had shown them. All I could think to say was, 
Let's go find Jacob. Chapter 31. I used my flint to relight the lantern, so now we had three glowing, which was abundant light. Once I took off my shawl and flung into the rowboat, it took just moments for us to push into the cove water. I took up the center seat, placed my relit lantern at my feet, and snatched up the oars. Thad was at the stern, his lantern next to him. Sam was in the bow, holding his lantern high, searching for a boat. I started rowing. Just tell me what direction to go in. Ahead, said Sam. There is, I thought, no other way to go. The morning fog was thicker over by the bay than on the land, so dense that we quickly lost sight of the beach. We could have been a few yards from shore or a hundred miles out on the way to nowhere. It was once the splash of oars and the swaying of the boat that told me we were on the water. Sorry, it was only the splash of the oars that was told me we were on the water. Port, said Sam after a bit. You're on, you're fine on the bow, Sam said. You know you're sailing, Lingo. Told you, returned Sam. I come from Sag Harbor. You sail before you walk. A whaling port, is it? Thad asked. You ever go whaling? Three-year voyage. That was enough. But I learned ships, and one of the jack tars taught me bolt bugling. I pulled along for a while with no talk other than Sam's direction. There's a ship, right, Sam said, but suddenly he hissed, stop. Startled, I shoved the oar handles down so that the blades lifted from the water. No talk, Sam said urgently. I listened. I heard nothing except for the dripping oars. Plip, plop, plip, plop. Blow out the lanterns. Sam said in a low voice. We snuffed our lights. With darkness complete, every sense of direction vanished, leaving nothing but damp air and water. I wanted to say, what is it? But I didn't speak. I didn't dare. We drifted. The slap of water against our little boat was the sole sound. Then, from somewhere, and I wasn't sure from what direction, I heard what sounded like the soft splash of careful oars. It started. It stopped started again. I looked to where I thought the noise was coming from. Next moment, I saw a splodge of light that lasted seconds. Then everything became dark again, but something was out there. What was that? I whispered. No one replied. I listened hard, but nothing else came. Sam, low voice, said, a beam, starboard side. We coasted, our rowboat gently rocked by small ripples, Ripples, perhaps made by whoever was near, if it was someone. I tried to aim my eyes where I had seen the light, not certain if the light had been truly there. The faint splashing was altogether gone. We floated on. I said, was it someone? Sam's voice, still low, said, gone now. Who do you think? Someone must have seen our lantern light, said Thad, and moved away. Sam said, the crimps, maybe. Crimps, I cried. Shh, Sam cautioned. We didn't speak. All was still. Or fishermen, Thad said, still in a low voice. I said, could it have been Jacob being taken somewhere? Sure, Sam muttered. Unable to restrain myself, I yelled, Jacob! As if in response, I heard quick splashes on the starboard side, which made my heart thump. Jacob! I cried again only silence. Dang, said Thad. They were close. Took off, said Sam, barely above a whisper. To me, Thad said, you chase them off. I felt abashed, and I knew I owned it. I wished I hadn't shouted. No one spoke until I said, how many people do you think there were? No notion. Jacob? Maybe. But, shh, Sam warned, they could be following us. They'd be as soon dump and drown us if they find us, those killers. We sat in silence, our rowboat floating gently, even as my heart pounded. I realized that the darkness had gradually turned somewhat lighter. It was now becoming a shade of gray, enough to suggest that dawn was coming. As the night continued to lift, the dead ship seemed to rise up out of the water as if slowly emerging from the cove. It was fantastical. As for another small boat near ours, I saw none. After a while, Sam said, when you came to the cove, anyone you see coming down the hill, anyone follow you? I 
thought a bit. And that's when I remembered who that man was that came upon me while I was waiting by our tent for Thad. The man with the broken nose and the pistol sitting outside the chief police office. A man, I said, who knows me. Someone who overheard what I had said to the police chief. What did he hear? Sam asked. Everything you told me. And then I added, and Senor Rosales said the police worked with the crimps. Do you think that's true? Could be, said Thad. I said, that man knows I'm looking for Jacob. Sam said, Castle saw you at the Mercury last night, and that man saw you. If your senor is right, I'd say he and Castle are working together to keep you from finding your brother. Thad said, maybe the one we just heard out there. The thought of that violent-looking man made my nervousness increase. I said, do you think he came about and is following us? No one answered, just listened. In the hush that followed, all I could hear were my own thoughts rebuking myself. Stupid, stupid. After a while, Sam said, all right then, understand this. If the police are working with Castle and they know you're looking for your brother, it'll make things worse. Boots to buttons, they're out here, either dodging us or trying to find us. But which? Take your pick. Thad stared out over the water. Whoever they are, they're gone. We better move. But I asked, what if they're following us? Sam said, hey, we either do something or not. Anyway, said Thad, can't be sure it was them. Just need to keep listening. I began to row again then, trying to make as little noise as possible. There was just enough light so we didn't have to relight the lanterns. No one spoke until Sam said, ahead, there's a ship. There was a thump. Our rowboat jolted. We're on her. Okay, I'm going to keep reading. Chapter 32 is not that long. Chapter 32. I'll look for a way to get on, I said, and began to row round the ship's hull, looking for a rope ladder. On the stern, I could read the ship's name, Western Queen. Sam in the bow held up his lantern. Got something. Got something, he called. He grabbed a line limp and tied it to our rowboat. Next moment, he scrambled up the side of the ship, going much faster than Thad and I had done. He even had his lamp handle looped around his arm. Thad followed, then me, climbing the way we had before, which might be best described as crawling up the hull. It was hard enough, though this ship proved easier than the one the night before. I was becoming practiced. It wasn't long before all, th all three of us were standing on the main deck. To Sam, Thad said, where did you learn to climb like that? On the whaler, climb enough mass and spars and you can climb anything. How old were you? Seven. That's young. Told you some people like to be waited on. We looked about. A blanket of gray mist blurred everything while a whiff, whiff of decay hung over all. Even so, we could see that the Western Queen was enormous, much bigger than the two ships Thad and I had been on the night before. It gave forth soft grindings and creakings, the noise coming from everywhere and nowhere all at once. The Western Queen may have been in her watery grave, but she lay uneasy. Another large ship floated right next to her, so near that the spars from both ships wove among one another like interlinked fingers. Tori, Thad called, let me have your flint box. One by one, he relit our three lanterns. The three of us stayed close, wandering around the deck, trying not to make noise, but peering into everything. See that, said Sam. He pointed to what looked like a big brick box sitting on the deck. It's a triworks, which means we're on a whaler. It's where the, they boil the blubber. Right now, in our lanterns, we could be burning the oil they made. Sam, with his superior knowledge of ships, led the way and enabled us to search effectively and efficiently. But it made no difference. We found no hint of Jacob. After coming into, onto Companion Way, Sam guided us down to the tween deck. It was all a jumble, a mix of clothing, open trunks, hats, shoes, lamps, and bedding, as if the crew had left the ship in great haste, perhaps right after dropping their anchor into the cove, just as we had witnessed on the Stephanie Kay. Every time we opened a door or looked into a cabin, I'd become tense, hoping we were about to find Jacob. It must have been obvious because Sam turned to me and said, Want some advice? 
please. Not easy, he said, but don't go expecting to find your brother with every turn we take. You'll get too twitchery. You'll give yourself brain hurt. We'll find him good. Otherwise, we'll just keep looking. And look, we did. Using our rowboat, we went to perhaps seven, if not more, ships. I lost count. Each boat was a bit different, two masts or three, fancy woodwork or dull woodwork, steering wheel, rudder bar, steering house, steering well, yet they all seemed so much the same. Main decks, companion ways, tween decks, cargo hold. The more we searched, the faster we got at it. We went clamoring from ship to ship. After boarding yet another ship, a large three-mast vessel, we hurried over the main deck but found nothing. Then we went into the galley, where plates with some rotten food lay on a long table. Much of it had been eaten by rats. Their droppings were everywhere. Might as well try the forecastle before moving on, said Sam. Holding the lantern before him, he took us along the lower deck toward the bow. The forecastle, Sam explained, was where ordinary crew, mem crew members had their living quarters. We reached it, found the door open, and went in. It was extended cabin, shaped like a half moon. On the long, straight middle side, what, what, sorry, was what looked to be a mast running from below and up through the ceiling. On the port side, which was curved, our lantern light revealed two levels of deep bunk beds, eight in all, some with bedding. There were three chests on the floor, clothing hanging on pegs. On the starboard side was a fixed table with two bowls and as many spoons. It was though someone had just been eating and only left moments ago. It was I who saw the copper colored coin. It lay next to one of the half empty plates. I picked it up. When I looked at it closely, I gasped. <gasps> Dare I stop there? <laughs> I'll just read you one more line so you know why she gasped. But I can't read all of chapter 33, it's too long. What is it, Sam said. My brother's Henry Clay token. Token? It's something my father gave Jacob from an election. My brother always had it with him. I looked at the others. He must have been here, just here, eating at this table. So I'm going to stop there. So that's a hint that maybe they're getting closer to finding him.